Sean Reynolds is a 36-year-old IT professional from the San Francisco area. He's lived all his life suffering from what most people call color blindness. I can see colors. It's not as though the world is black and white, but certain areas of the spectrum, it's difficult for me to tell the difference between colors. So, for example, certain shades of red and green, for me, are what are most difficult for me to tell apart. So my eyes are weak in the green part of the spectrum, and the red and green overlap. So I have difficulty telling things like status lights on electronics. If it's an LED that uses red and green, a lot of times those reds and greens are very close to one another, right in that area that I have trouble telling. It's not colorblindness. The colorblind man sees the yellow end of the spectrum and sees the blue end of the spectrum. And so he does see colors, but he can't see a full spectrum. And colors tend not to be as important a part of his life as it is for the rest of us. That's Dr. Michael Marmore, professor of ophthalmology at the Stanford University School of Medicine and the Byers Eye Institute there. He says that the most common type of color blindness by far, the type Reynolds has, is called red-green color blindness. But he and many other eye professionals prefer to call it color vision deficiency because only some colors are invisible. Everything from green down to red is seen the same way. So as a result, red and yellow appear the same, and yellow and orange appear the same. But green actually lies right between the yellow end of the spectrum and the blue end of the spectrum. Green is a faded grayish color to the colorblind man. It is really not seen as a distinct color. But in spite of that markedly different way of seeing the world, color blindness wasn't even known to exist until about 200 years ago. The first paper that actually described this condition as a congenital problem was written by the famous English chemist John Dalton in 1794 because he was colorblind and he recognized from what friends were telling him that he wasn't seeing what they were and that his brother had the same problem and that a bunch of other men had it. Prior to that time, the colorblind individual had a real problem. He would look at a picture or look at something and describe it, and others would say, ah, your judgment is terrible, and he couldn't understand why. And there were some painters trying to paint who were probably colorblind. Of course, we didn't have exams prior to that time, who were known as terrible with colors and sometimes had to hire other artists to do their work. And they could never really understand why they couldn't do it right. Today, we know that colorblindness is an inherited condition. Marmore says that about 8% of men have it to some degree, but only about 1.5% are unable to tell red from yellow from green at all. Only about one half of 1% of women are afflicted. The problem results from a genetic alteration of the structure of the eye. Our normal daylight vision comes through photoreceptor cells that change light to a nerve signal that are called cones. And we have three types of cones. Normally, we have cones that are predominantly blue sensitive, predominantly green sensitive, or predominantly red sensitive. But the genetics for the green and red sensitive cones is carried on the X chromosome. And it's not uncommon out there in the population at large to have a faulty gene for either the green sensitive cones or the red sensitive cone. And that's the problem. If a man gets a faulty X chromosome from his mother and doesn't have red sensitive cones, all he has are the green sensitive cones. He doesn't see red well and he can't distinguish any colors between red and green. Someone will say, oh, look at that green such and such over there, and I won't know what they're referring to. I'll need some other description of it. If someone says, take that green door on the left, I'll need, is there a sign on it? Is there some other way for me to know which door to take? Reynolds says traffic lights don't give him a problem, though studies show colorblind people are slightly slower to react to them. Apparently, the medical field isn't too concerned about colorblindness, Marmer says tests for it are not part of a standard eye exam. Nobody ever died of color deficiency. Well, uh, perhaps if they run a red light, but the disease is not serious. An ophthalmologist might do it on children just to find out or to advise mom. But it's one of those things that unless it's quite severe in the discrimination problem, the youngster is beginning to have trouble like being teased because they're wearing a green sock and a red sock. It's not a medical problem of any consequence. And it's not something you can do anything about. So by and large, it's a test that's done when somebody notices a problem and asks, hey, is this real? So it's not uncommon for some men to make it to adulthood not knowing they're colorblind. 
Marmore says it's often a new wife who will notice mismatched socks and bring her colorblind husband in for a test. But now, if that test comes up positive, there is something that can be done for many people with color blindness. They look like sunglasses and were invented as laser protective eyewear. Back in the early 2000s, I was melting and manufacturing a lot of glass lenses for laser safety eyewear, which I was providing to laser companies down in Silicon Valley. And I found out through these companies that they were having a problem that the laser surgeons were borrowing, shall we say, the eyewear and taking them home with them. And they were using them as sunglasses. That's Dr. Don McPherson, vice president of products for Enchroma Incorporated in Berkeley, California, and inventor of Enchroma CX lenses. He says he started wearing a pair of sunglasses, too, to see what the attraction was. Eventually, he wore them to an ultimate Frisbee tournament. And a friend of mine borrowed my sunglasses, and it turned out he was colorblind. And he said that for the first time, he could differentiate the fluorescent orange field marking cones from the bright green grass, and that was a bit of a shock to me. But like I said, I found out he was colorblind, and as a scientist, I got curious about that and started to research it. That led to three grants from the National Institutes of Health to do clinical trials to try to understand what was going on and see if we could develop eyewear that would be beneficial for color deficients. McPherson says the glasses work for about 80% of people who have red-green color blindness, those who have a type called anomalous trichromacy. And what differentiates it from more severe forms of color deficiency is in those more severe forms, you might only have one or two functional photopigments in your eye instead of the normal three. But in anomalous trichromacy, the kind that we can correct with chroma glasses, all three photopigments are present. It's just that one of those three photopigments, in this case one of the green or red sensitive ones, is shifted spectrally so that it overlaps its neighboring photopigment too much. And what happens then, you look at something that has a color to it, say a red apple, and instead of getting a very distinct signal to each of your photopigments, you get a signal to your green and red photopigment which are too similar. So when the brain tries to understand what that color is, it comes up with brown. And when it looks at the leaves on the apple tree, it also gets brown. And that's where the color confusion comes in. McPherson says the glasses work by filtering out the overlap of colors. Just imagine that you have a rainbow. And the place where this overlap occurs is occurring in the yellow portion of the spectrum. And what the glasses do is they remove that section of wavelength of light, the yellow wavelength, which are the cause of the confusion. And in essence... You can just visually imagine they're pushing the two photopigments back apart so they don't overlap as much. And in so doing, you reestablish something like normal color perception. But it's not as if someone who's been colorblind their whole life can just slap on a pair of sunglasses. McPherson says the brain can be confused by what the eyes are now seeing, so it takes some time to adapt. Since they're getting new information to their brain, new quantitative data, they have to understand it. And sometimes that takes just a matter of a minute, and for some people it takes days before they can understand what they're seeing. So when they do start to recognize colors that they haven't seen before, it's pretty overwhelming emotionally for them. Sean Reynolds signed up to test in Chroma's glasses, and while his first wearing wasn't emotional, it was certainly striking. I got in my car and started driving away from their office, and immediately there were things like there was a tree in front of a brick wall, and all of a sudden, the difference between the red brick and the green tree just absolutely leaped out at me. It was surprising to me how different those colors were when before I could tell the difference, but they weren't so distinct. You know, I turned the corner, and there were some California poppies in a person's yard, and the orange of them was super vibrant. It really jumped out at me. I just thought, wow, those are some really colorful flowers. And then the biggest surprise was I turned the next corner and I came to a traffic light. It was red when I got there. And when it turned green, that green light was really, really green. I didn't expect that at all. McPherson says he hears that a lot. Colorblind men report they can more confidently shop for clothes or for fruits and vegetables. They're also more confident driving. And for some children, seeing in color makes a difference in school. Something around three-quarters of all information is visual, and a large majority of that, as you know, is color-coded. 
So they find that people perform better in a learning environment if they can detect all the colors. And we're getting reports back from the parents of kids that their children are performing better in school. And while relatively few professions require accurate color vision, among them pilots and police and fire personnel in some jurisdictions, there are some jobs where it certainly helps. Painters, for example, and Reynolds says IT. And while a lot of people downplay the impact of color blindness, Reynolds says they probably have never experienced it. Color blindness usually isn't life-threatening, but it does detract from a person's quality of life. With his new glasses, now Reynolds says he looks forward to going outside just to see what he's always missed. Now he can stop and see the roses. You can find out more about CX lenses for color blindness at enchroma.com. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.net. I'm Reed Pence. The growing Alzheimer's disease crisis is straining the American economy. According to the Alzheimer's Association 2015 Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, total payments for caring for those with Alzheimer's and other dementias will reach $226 billion this year. By the year 2050, it will top $1 trillion in today's dollars. Robert Agee, Chief Policy Officer for the Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease of the nation. Nearly one in five Medicare dollars is spent on people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. By 2050, it's going to be nearly one in every three Medicare dollars. And so we have to change this current trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. And to do that, our scientists need consistent and meaningful support for research from the federal government. The Alzheimer's Association says the U.S. could save $220 billion within five years of a treatment that delays the onset of Alzheimer's being discovered. Find out more about the 2015 Facts and Figures Report at ALZ.org. Geico presents Fan Mail to a Pig. Dear Maxwell, I just want to say thank you for making my Geico Insurance ID card digital. It's easy to find on the app. It doesn't give me paper cuts, and I always have it on hand because it's on my phone. Because of this, I finally cleaned out my glove box, which was filled with years of paper ID cards. Any thought on what I should put in my glove box now? Sincerely, Trent Patterson. Hmm, Trent, what can you put in the glove box? Here's a crazy thought. How about gloves? Digital insurance ID cards, just a tap away on the GEICO app.